Good morning to one and all, those who are following this uh, worship service live online at home. May you have a blessed time uh, attending to God's Word uh, today. <clears throat> you know, two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago on the first Sunday of uh, this month, I announced that we have arrived uh, at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in our sermon series uh, from uh, this wonderful, marvelous book. Today, the third Sunday of the month, we are still at chapter 7, but we did take a break uh, last Sunday when Elder Max uh, spoke on a topical on Mother's Day. And next week, uh, Pastor Daniel will continue our study of 1 Corinthians when he speaks on the topic of singleness from the last section of chapter 7. Chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, uh, in most uh, opinions of uh, conservative scholars, is one of the most interesting chapters in the New Testament. And it holds, of course, many, many lessons for us. And we're going to look today at verses 17 to 24 to help you see where Paul is coming from. Let me calibrate uh, for you where this passage sits in with the immediate context. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul in this chapter is answering questions uh, the Corinthian Christians asked him in a letter. Paul started to answer their questions beginning at chapter 7. Paul answers their questions here. Paul replies uh, with his apostolic answers to no less than six questions uh, that is uh, in a letter that was uh, written by the Corinthian Christians to him. Unfortunately, the letter is lost. So reading, reading Paul's answers here is like listening uh, to one end of a telephone conversation. He reprimanded them for sins in the first six chapters. And Paul had sternly re re reprimanded uh, the Corinthians for various sins they were committing. And then starting at chapter 7, like I said, he turns he turns his attention to answer their questions. So, what are the questions that uh, the Corinthians ask him? You know, uh, up to this point, that is, up to verse 16 of chapter 7, he had dealt with the following. And uh, why are we, by the way, considering this? We consider them because Paul's apostolic pronouncements to their questions are important to us. They carry applications that are current to us. We have similar issues in our culture today. And then he has dealt with sexual relationships within a Christ Christian marriage. Should married couples continue normal sexual relationships after becoming Christians? The answer is yes. It is their duty to do so. And this you will find in the first seven verses of uh, chapter 7. And then, uh, should single persons get married? The answer is again yes. In all normal situations, but for the specially gifted, Staying unmarried could be advantageous, uh, especially in unsettled times. And then the other question uh, that uh, he dealt with was, is divorce permitted for Christians? The answer is a qualified and allowed no. Uh, we find that in uh, verses 10 to 11 of 1 Corinthians 7. And then, uh, are Christian 
and non-Christian marriages binding? The answer is yes, except when the unbeliever deserts the Christian partner. This has to be correctly understood. Uh, Paul does not mean to imply that marriages between Christians and non-Christians are biblically permitted just because he refers to it. In the society and culture in Corinth at that time, when the church was founded, there were mixed marriages, that is, married couples becoming Christians after they marry, or when one of the married partners become Christians and the other did not, but agreed to stay married, the marriage is binding. The only exception is when the unbelieving partner, in Paul's words, desert the marriage. The Westminster Confession of Faith calls this willful desertion, willful desertion. He or she departs, deserts the union and family. Uh, only in cases like this and in cases of outright infidelity are divorces permitted. And all the cases that I know of fall in this category. So we are biblically okay as a church. We have not committed any wrongs in this regard. So the general principle in Paul's answers uh, we need to take note of is this. Do not seek. Do not seek to change in your status. That is the central idea governing this part of the text. And with that as the backdrop, we can now approach our text. Let me read for you our text here, taken from verse 17 to verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 7. Only, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule to all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision nor, uh, f- nor neither circumcision uh, counts for anything, neither do uncircumcision, but keeping. The commandments of God counts for everything. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a born servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourselves uh, to the opportunity. Verse 22, For he who was called in the Lord as a born servant is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was freed when called is a born servant of Christ. You were brought with a price. Do not become born servants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. This is the word of God. Hope he will bless us in the reading of his holy word. Now, What is Paul saying here? What is he teaching? You know, there are two, if you look at the text carefully, there are two recurring motifs or patterns in the text that informs us of what was in Paul's mind. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul teaches us a very practical Christian principle. Let me draw the first pattern out of the text for you. The pattern, the first pattern can be seen in the words that I have highlighted here in green. What is Paul teaching? What 
Paul is teaching is expressed in the text, highlighted uh, in green here. Verse 17, the Lord has assigned to each one of us a particular life situation in which we are to live out our Christian lives. And then verse 18, Paul is saying, is using the example of Jews and non-Jew Christians to illustrate the principle that when one becomes a Christian, one should live the life that the Lord has assigned to him. Here the example is a circumcised Jew, when he becomes a Christian, should not seek to undo his circumcision. And a pagan or a Greek, when he becomes a Christian, should not seek circumcision. This, of course, had to be understood in a cultural context uh, of Corinth at that time. There were many Jews and pagans who became Christians then. They were mixed marriages, Christians, non-Christians, believers married to non-believers, and pagan marriages when one became a Christian after uh, their marriage. And verse 20 makes the principle a lot clearer. Each one should remain in his or her condition in which he or her was called. This principle is applicable to all the different cases mentioned here. <clears throat> Stay in the condition in which you were called. And then verse 24, Paul ends by re-emphasizing this principle. So brothers, so he's addressing Christians. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain. Now let me highlight the second motif. The second motif which supports this principle and adds more focus to it. I've highlighted the second motif uh, in yellow. I highlighted the word call or call in yellow in this text. You can see that this word call or called is repeated practically in every verse, in one form or another, in this whole passage. It is clear what is foremost in Paul's mind. You know, most Bible scholars are agreed that this calling here refers to the call to salvation rather than a call to vocation. Uh, <clears throat> all of us, are called to be Christians, but not all of uh, you are called to be pastors or missionaries. So the call here is generally agreed is a call to salvation. Now, what does this mean? It means that you were called, chosen, elected, if you want it in theological language. You were chosen, you were called to be a Christian. You were called out of the bondage of sin and death to eternal life in Christ. And the implication, the obligatory implication is that you have to live accordingly. Therefore, Paul, Paul underlines uh, uh, this implication here by saying, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. This is meant for you and I and everyone here who belongs to Christ. So it is current, it is meant for us. So what does this mean to us today? What does it mean? The message to us is in whatever situation in life, that God has led you into, there abide and shine for Christ. In whatever situation in life that God has led you into, there abide and shine for Christ. This principle is also taught to us by Apostle Peter. 
where he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9, he says, but you are chosen. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, this principle is ex as expressed here carries radical implications for us. Note the following. You were chosen. That means you are called. God specifically picked you from out of this world to make you his own possession. You are called to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation that is, that is separated from out of the world to be God's own precious possession. This means we belong to Him. We are His people. In every real way, we are His people. It is not just that we pledge our allegiance to Him. No, it is that He has taken ownership of us. We belong to Him. We don't belong to the world. Neither do we belong to ourselves. We belong to Christ Jesus. Now, how do we abide? How do we abide in the situation God has called us to and there shine for Christ? The, answer, the answers are actually all in our text today. <clears throat> Verse 17, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. Lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. The overarching application of this verse is this. God has called each one of us first into the fellowship of Jesus. We are called into the fellowship of Jesus. And he assigns a role at particular times for us to fulfill in the setting in which the Lord has placed us. And the roles that He assigns us are first and foremost our responsibility to our families, to our work, to our neighbours, to our church. These are our, are our assignments the relationship that God has given us to live in it at any one time. So, if you're a student, live as a student, live for Christ as a student. If you are in national service, live the role of a national service man and try to shine for a Christ. If you're a housekeeper, a wife or a mother, live out those roles that God has assigned for you. This does not mean, this does not mean that God uh, allows the believer no change, no change of status, employment or residence. The Lord often leads His people into areas of life and gives them different roles. For example, you may be a student at one stage, a wife or a husband in another, and a mother or father in another. So wherever Christ leads you, whatever station He places you in, there remain and shine for Christ. The point is, in whatever calling God places us in, we must reflect His glory. We must live worthily in that place and environment as Christians who demonstrate the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who is redeemed by Christ belongs to Him. And His will, Christ's will, must become the supreme rule of our life and all our actions. Now, in this message, Paul uses two, in this text, in this passage, he uses two examples to illustrate and emphasize this point. First, in verse 18 and 19, he uses the example of Jewish 
and non-Jewish Christians. And second, in verses 21 to 20, 22, he uses the example of bond servants, uh, uh, bond servant Christians, that is a Christian slave, a Christian servant in the Roman times, and a free man Christian. So he uses these two uh, powerful examples to illustrate his point. So let's consider the first example, the Jewish and non-Jewish uh, Christian. We find this, we find this in the verses 18 and 19. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not speak or to seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at that time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the law of God. Now, it may occur to you very quickly in your mind that this doesn't apply to us, so why are you talking about it? I'm talking about it here because Paul is referring to Jews who became Christians and to Greek and pagans who became Christian. And that is what circumcision and uncircumcision refers to. Let me give you a little biblical history that is necessary to understand this before we can fully uh, apply it. You know, the Greeks, the Greeks exercise new. Yep, they don't wear any clothes when they exercise. How would you like to join a gym where people exercise naked? But the Jews in, did in those days. So in those days, both Greek and Jews frowned greatly upon circumcision. Some Jews who became Christians were ashamed of their circumcision and they tried various surgical and non-surgical methods to appear uncircumcised. Paul told these Christians not to bother about such things. If you were circumcised, don't seek uh, to undo your circumcision. But if you are not circumcised, don't seek circumcision when you become a Christian. So Paul's point here is neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God counts for everything. In other words, obedience to God's law is of paramount importance. So how, how is this applicable for us? How, what does this mean for us today? This is very applicable to us today, mature or young Christians alike. Let me explain. The Jewish believers who sought to undo the circumcision and the Greeks who sought circumcision were unduly influenced by the norms and values of the society that they were then living in. They were trying to conform to the world. They were trying to follow the fashions and the values of the world. Today, the fallen world's culture is exerting tremendous pressure and influence over our lives to get us to conform, to follow worldly fashions, the culture of idolizing celebrities, fetish trends, radicalism, and peer pressure on the young. All this work to get you to conform to the norms and standards of the world. So Paul's teaching here is, don't follow. Don't follow or obey the norms of the world. Obedience to God is more, much, much more important. So as a Christian, as a Christian, standing with Christ is more important than standing with the world. Quote Robert Chu, no copyrights, you are free to use it. All Christians, standing with Christ is more important 
and standing with the world. The second example of the born servant and the free man uh, servant illustrates the same principle but adds some instructions on how to apply the, the uh, principles of Christian calling. Let us consider it now. This you will find in verses 21 to 24. Were you a born servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. <clears throat> Verse 22. For he who has called, was, was called in the Lord as a born servant is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was freed when called is a born servant of Christ. And then verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of, uh, of men. Verse 24, he repeats uh, that uh, principle for emphasis. In whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. So Paul's question in verse 21 is this. Were you a slave when you were called to salvation? Were you a slave when you were called to salvation? And Paul's answer is, don't be concerned about it. And then he adds, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Again, a little bit of uh, history uh, will help you to understand this. The Roman economy at that time depends on slaves. And some scholars estimated that there may be two slaves to one Roman citizen or, or something more than that. So the Roman whole Roman economy depends on uh, slaves. They include prisoners of war, sailors captured and sold by pirates or slaves uh, bought from outside the Roman territory. You know, in hard times in those days, it was not uncommon for desperate families to sell their children into slavery to raise money. Uh, there were also Greek freemen, educated professional Greek freemen who sell themselves to the household of wealthy Roman citizens, often holding lucrative positions of stewards of household, guardians or tutors or accountants for these rich Roman citizens. They could invest their owner's funds and run his business legitimately acquiring wealth. So it was possible, possible for them to buy their way out of their voluntary uh, slavery and thereby gain Roman citizenship as free men for themselves and for their family. The Roman citizenship at that time was very, very precious. The point to note here is Roman slavery was not based on race. It was not based on race. If you are a captured sailor and if you are a soul, and you could be a passion, you could be a media, you could be from uh, Babylon or whatever, Roman slavery is not based on race. So I want you to note the use of the word call. Paul used it in these uh, a few verses twice. Paul's teaching is, it was not only wealth that counted in the Roman Empire, especially in a Roman colony such as Corinth. It was not wealth that counts for anything but calling your calling. He is referring to the special calling to salvation by faith in Christ. So Paul's point is when a slave becomes a Christian, he gains a new status with God. This is how he put it in verse 22. For he who was called in the Lord as a born servant is a free man of the Lord. Paul, of course, uh, is using paradoxical language uh, here. A slave is a free man in Christ, and freedom in Christ far, far outweighs his slavery. 
the bond servant can consider himself Christ's free man. In this, in his secular condition, he is still a slave, but in his spiritual condition, he is now free. The point is this: a Christian has submitted himself to Christ. He is Christ's slave now. He now obeys the Lord. He owes Christ both loyalty and service. And that is where we all are today. We are called to be with Christ. So we owe Christ our loyalty and our service if we call ourselves Christians. Paul emphasized this in verse 23. You were bought with a price. And the price paid for you is the highest price ever paid by somebody for uh, you. You were bought with a price, so do not become born servants of men. This is applicable to both the slave and the free person. The slave has been freed, and the free man has been made a slave, because both have been purchased by Christ. All should be content with his status, because all are equal subjects. Regardless of race, regardless of status, all are equal subjects of redemption and members of God's family. And Paul reiterate uh, the point in verse 24. So brothers, so Christian brothers and sisters, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Christians are to keep the commandments of God as Paul said in verse 19, Christians are called to keep the commandments of God in every situation in which they find themselves. Sometimes we find ourselves in very difficult situations and are tempted to cut corners or disobey God. That is not the will of God. So, let me take the whole line of Paul's argument and reasoning in 1 Corinthians 7 up to this point, and let me conclude with these remarks uh, here. Paul speaks about difficult marriages at the beginning of this chapter. Sometimes, uh, <clears throat> people fall into very difficult marriages. There are no grounds for divorce. Absolutely no grounds for divorce, except for sexual immorality or desertion by a non-Christian. The marriage is just filled with difficulty of one kind or another. So Paul says, stay, stay in that situation and remain obedient to God, because you do not know. By your perseverance and your faith, you may convert uh, the spouse. And then he speaks to those people who are married. Paul teaches that those who are married must remain married. It is entirely possible to keep God's commandments even in a very difficult marriage. It certainly won't be easy, but it can be done with the grace and help of God. And then to the singles and the unmarried, Paul says that those who are single are encouraged to remain single. Although it would not be wrong to get married, should God bring the right person into your lives. The way Paul wrote this, singlehood is a gift. It's a special gift. So to the, mar to the unmarried, to the singles, uh, <clears throat> he encouraged them to remain single or unmarried. But although it's not wrong, if God brings a certain right person in, by all means, uh, 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 do get married. Finally, on uh, our calling, the message today is live. Live as obedient Christians. 
live as Christ, obedient Christian lives in whatever situation, in whatever circumstances God has put you in. So the tagline is, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain. Not only remain in that circumstances, but remain in that situation, but there let him remain with God. Come, let us bow in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word to us this morning. We want to thank you for this marvelous teaching that we have been able uh, to learn from this uh, wonderful passage in 1 Corinthians 7. May you convict and strengthen it into our lives and grant us the grace and the conviction and the resolve to live lives that are holy, live lives that are uncompromising, and live lives that are obedient entirely to your word for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we make this prayer. Amen.